Shania Nicole Davis was born June 14, 2004 in Fayetteville, North Carolina to parents Bradley Lockhart and Antoinette Davis. Shania was a happy, loving, and friendly little girl who was described as a good little helper around the house. She loved to play dress up and play with her Barbie dolls, but also loved the outdoors and riding her scooter. Pink and yellow were her favorite colors. Around the time of our story, she was a kindergarten student at Morganton Road Elementary School. Bradley had raised Shania with the help of his sister, Carrie Lockhart Davis. This was until 2009 when he agreed to let Shania stay with her mother because he felt that Antoinette was ready to be a mom again after overcoming financial problems. And this is where a lot of people make mistakes. All right, when you have a gut intuition that tells you this person should not be allowed alone with my kid or this person doesn't make really good life decisions that's usually a really good indication that they're not going to make very good decisions for your child and so putting a child with somebody who is not making good life choices for themselves is not somebody that that child is going to be safe with make sense according to bradley quote she had asked if she could be a mother, and I felt she was sincere in asking, and I figured to give her a chance." End quote. However, Shania's aunt Carrie felt differently. In fact, Carrie never got along with Antoinette because she felt that the mother neglected her kids. And see, this is where the biggest problem that I have with our system is, is when people come out and they say, look, this this person, and this is more so when it comes to mothers, like, because they'll throw the book at a dad. Like, dads have got to be on the up and up. We've got to be superstars in order to get joint custody of our kids. Whether, um, meanwhile, mothers can literally, there's no standards for mothers at all. Like, they can literally be as bad as they want to be. They can, their boyfriends can be as bad as they want to be. It does not matter what the mother does. They're not going to remove that child unless... Honestly, it typically comes down to them having to kill one of the kids before they remove the other kids because that's typically what it takes for them to realize maybe she's not a good mom. <clears throat> However, in this case, again, when you start saying this person's neglecting this child, that's, that's something that needs to be taken seriously. And that's what we employ Child Protective Services to do is to look into these accounts and more often than not these accounts are found quote-unquote unfitted meaning they didn't find any evidence of that but mind you when cps is coming to your house you know exactly what time date that they're going to be at your house so you already know when to expect them and they're usually only there for 30 minutes so anybody could play nice for 30 minutes it's what they do when you leave that's the problem. And that needs to be better understood so that we can try to make sure this stuff doesn't happen or continue to happen because really the problem is getting worse. How bad does it have to be before we wake up? In September 2009, five-year-old Shania moved in with her mother and her seven-year-old brother, Carl. The family lived in a trailer at the Sleepy Hollow trailer park that was rented by Antoinette's sister, Brenda Davis. The accommodations were cramped. Brenda, her boyfriend, Jeroy Smith, and their children stayed in the back bedroom, while Antoinette and her children stayed in the front room of the trailer. Brenda had previously dated a man named Mario Andrette McNeil, who went by the name Mono. Now, Mono had given Brenda money to use as a security deposit to move into her trailer at Sleepy Hollow. While they were together, he spent a lot of time in the trailer. He was familiar with Antoinette and her children. He also knew how to get inside even if the door was locked. Uh, keep that in mind as it's going to be important as we go through this story. Number one, he lent her money. Number two, he knew how to get into the house even if it was locked. That's going to be two very important key factors in this case that we're going over today. 
At the time of our story, Mono lived with a woman named April Autry, who was the mother of his 18-month-old daughter. He lived with her on Washington Drive in Fayetteville. This was roughly a seven-minute drive south of the Sleepy Hollow trailer park. Despite living with the mother of his child, Mono still was talking with other women. On the evening of November 9th and continuing into the early morning hours of November 10th, Mono was having a one-man party. After using coke and taking a couple shots of liquor, he began, in his words, texting all the females in his phone. He tried to text Brenda, but her phone was turned off. So he moved on to another woman, Tysa McLean. Tysa, who also lived at the Sleepy Hollow trailer park, began exchanging text messages with Mono and agreed to invite him over to hook up. However, by the time he got there at 2.52 a.m., Tysa had fallen asleep and she didn't answer the door. By 3.06 a.m., Mono texted her goodnight, and a minute later, he resumed trying to get in contact with Brenda. At around 5.30 a.m., Brenda woke up because she thought she heard the door open. She mentioned this to Jeroy, but neither went to check on what it was. They went back to sleep, but were awoken a half an hour later by Antoinette, who came into the room and asked if they had seen Shania. They said they hadn't. Antoinette went outside to search for her daughter. While Antoinette was outside, Carl told Brenda and Jeroy that Mono had been there the previous night. Jeroy asked Carl if he was sure about this, and he responded, yeah. Brenda texted and called Mono, but he did not answer his phone. Jeroy then called April Autry and told him that Mono was not with her. Alright, so like I said, keep this in mind, the fact that he knows how to get into this house, even if it's locked. Brenda who was the main renter of this house um woke up because she thought she heard a door open obviously probably didn't think nothing about it went back to sleep not long after that Antoinette the mother of Shania who also lives in the residence wakes up to find out that her daughter is not there wakes Brenda up says hey have you seen my kid they say no and this is where we're at now so, like I said, that's why I said, keep in mind, he knows how to get in, into the house, even if it's locked. Antoinette returned to the trailer and reported that she had knocked on all of the doors in Sleepy Hollow, but no one had seen Shania. Brenda told Antoinette to call the police, but Antoinette was hesitant to do so. Brenda and Jeroy went outside and noticed that the stairs and railings of the trailer contained feces that had not been there the night before. Alright, so if your kid's missing, you wake up, your kid's not in the house, You're, and you knocked on all the doors, nobody saw her, so you have no idea where your kid is, and you're hesitant about calling the police to come find her? Ain't that the next thing you would do? That's, that's what I would do, like it's what any normal parent who is concerned about their child's safety, that's what they would do, so why would you... That's, that in itself is a red flag, but let's continue. There was also what appeared to be illegible yellow writing scribbled within the feces on the railing. Shortly after 6 a.m. that same morning, Mono arrived at the Comfort Inn and Suites in Sanford, North Carolina, about an hour north of Fayetteville. He and I just want to touch base on this real quick. When I, when I said in the beginning of this video, I said this hits close to home. I really meant this hits close to home. The location they gave, Sanford, North Carolina, is about an hour, hour and a half drive from where I'm at right now. That's how close to home this hits. And that's why I wanted to do this story, and that's why I have such a big problem with our legal system, is because kids are stuck in horrible situations when people know there are problems there. People know that there are bad things going on. There are people put in place to protect the kids and it's not being done so with that being said what are we paying CPS for if they're not protecting the kids what are we paying court attorneys for and um, family family law attorneys for um, I mean judges family law judges what are we paying all them for if none of them are protecting the kids they're protecting the mothers is that does nobody see the problem there? 
and I, and I have such a big problem with this because again this happened not you know hour hour and a half from where I'm at and I've seen how the legal system in this state conducts issues related to child welfare and it's not good the majority of the time the kids are stuck in horrible situations simply because they don't want to remove a child from the mother and that's not benefiting the kid and in this case as you're gonna see it always or I would say 99% of the time ends with the child paying the ultimate sacrifice or the ultimate the ultimate I mean, yeah, I mean, the kids are just, they're paying the ultimate sacrifice because our system isn't doing their job. And that should be a problem for everybody. That We need a wake-up call. How many more kids have got to die before we wake up? Admit there's a problem and do what you need to do to protect the kid. Enter the hotel alone, provided identification, and checked into room 201 under his own name. There was video footage of the transaction because cameras operated continually throughout the hotel. Mono told the desk clerk, Jacqueline Lee, that he was traveling with his daughter to take her to her mother in Virginia. Video footage from hotel security cameras showed that after checking in, Mono returned to his vehicle in the back of the parking lot at approximately 7.16 a.m., where he remained for several minutes before coming back into the hotel, carrying a child, covered up with a blue blanket okay for anybody who might be confused like you hear two different people basically covering the same story and what it sounds like to me is because i've covered one of the stories i covered on my channel came from the lady that you hear speaking and i actually mentioned her video or her video channel or I mentioned her channel in the particular video that I covered from her video or commentated on so what it sounds like is he's commenting on the same woman or the same channel that I commented on previous so when it sounds and, and so then now you got mine so basically what it, it sounds like three different people telling the same story when in reality, it seems to be like one main person is telling the story, which is the lady. The guy commented on certain things of, or certain points of her story. And I'm putting my two cents into this as to what I've seen in our legal system and pointing out things that they're not mentioning. So basically, you're getting a story and two commentators all in the same video. So I didn't want it to like confuse anybody. That's what's going on. Um... But I just have some points of this story that I wanted to make that isn't actually covered in this story as it relates to the types of messages I've been trying to put across through my videos. Jacqueline observed Mono carrying the child on the video feed and noticed the texture of her hair, which Lee recalled when she saw an Amber Alert that was issued for Shania. Additionally, Seth Chambers, who was staying at the hotel during a business trip, passed Mono in the hallway near room 201 at 6.24 a.m. and saw him carrying a child. At the hotel's morning shift change, Regina Bacani replaced Jacqueline at the front desk. During the shift change, Mono came to the breakfast area alone, got a banana, some juice, and a muffin, and took them back to his room. Jacqueline pointed him out to Regina and told her about the recent check-in. Hotel cameras showed Mono walking towards the breakfast area at 6.36 a.m. and returning down the hall and into his room with food and drink in his hands. Back at Sleepy Hollow, Antoinette called the police at 6.52 a.m. at the urging of Brenda. Okay, ma'am, how can I help you? I woke up this morning and my daughter was not in the house. I don't know if she walked out. Or I don't know what's going on, but she's not here. How old is your daughter? She's five. Five? And your door was not unlocked, that's what you're telling me? No. All right, notice how distraught she sounds. And remember, it was mentioned that 
at first, this lady didn't even want to call 911 to report her daughter missing. Now she's sounding distraught. But I just wanted to point that out. So let's continue. It's not unlocked, but I'm telling you she knows how to unlock it. I'm hoping that she didn't unlock it and walk out. About 10 minutes after Antoinette's phone call, the police arrived, began searching for Shania with search dogs, and started interviewing people. Fayetteville police officer Elizabeth Culver observed a substance that was later determined to be feces on both railings of the front porch. The substance was smooth like something had been poured on it, and Antoinette had a cooking pot in her hand when Officer Culver arrived. Apparently, Antoinette had poured water on the railings. In the trash can of Unit 1119, police found a blanket that Antoinette identified as hers and that Jeroy recognized as having been in the living room of the trailer recently. All right, so for one, the, the, the lady didn't even want to call 911 to begin with. When she finally did, 10 minutes later they showed up and she's trying to cover up potential evidence because there's feces on the railing that wasn't there before. Why would you want to cover that up? That's evidence. You can, I mean, potential evidence that could possibly trace them to whoever took the child. And if you were really concerned about your child being taken, you would want to provide the, the cops with every single bit of information they could possibly collect in order to provide a better outcome for them finding your child alive. Right? The blanket was a thick child's comforter type blanket, and it had feces on it. Jennifer Slish, a forensic technician for the Fayetteville Police Department at the time, took the blanket into evidence to be processed. Officer Culver spoke with Antoinette, Brenda, Jeroy, and Carl at the scene. Carl seemed very distracted and would look at his aunt before responding. He said he remembered Shania coming to bed, but did not remember her leaving the bedroom. Later in our story, Carl admitted that he had seen Mono at the trailer that morning. Because Antoinette and Brenda were consistently looking at their phones and texting, Officer Culver had difficulty getting them to focus on the questions being asked. And that's another red flag. I mean, you called the cops to report your child missing. And instead of answering their questions so that they can get to work to find your child, you're on your phone? Like, that's really more important than finding your child. And I'm pretty sure whoever was messaging her wasn't somebody who had an indication on where the child was, obviously. So her lieutenant agreed to take them downtown to be interviewed. Officer Culver and her partner, Daniel Suggs, went to the main office of the trailer park to view the security video footage to look for a child roaming around the trailer park or for vehicles coming into the area. At approximately 7.34 a.m., the video cameras at the Comfort Inn and Suite showed Mono leaving room 201 and going to the elevator with a child. At 7.35, the video shows him exiting the side door of the hotel and walking down the sidewalk still carrying the little girl. Matthew Argyle, the hotel's maintenance worker at the time, appeared on the video one minute later. He was outside the side door picking up cigarette butts and trash when he saw Mono come out with a little girl on his shoulder. He had her covered, and Matthew believed that she was asleep. He said hello. Mono made eye contact with him before looking away without saying anything in response. He just continued walking toward the parking lot. Matthew noticed something was amiss, and he thus tried to observe Mono without making it obvious that he was doing so. Mono put the child in the right rear passenger side of his car, got into the driver's seat, and began smoking. Matthew continued to watch the man while acting like he was doing busy work because he just felt something was not right. Mono then drove to the pavilion at the front entrance and entered the hotel. He approached the front desk and asked Regina for his security deposit, stating that he had to get back on the road to drive his daughter to Virginia to meet her mother. Security cameras showed Regina giving Mono the cash receipt to sign and return the deposit. The housekeeper who later cleaned room 201 brought Regina one or two small clear open plastic packets with white residue that she had found in the room, which she believed to be coke. Meanwhile, 
Matthew watched Mono leave the hotel, drive away in his car, and turn left onto the main road. Matthew did not act on his feeling that something was wrong until the following day when hotel staff saw an Amber Alert and called law enforcement. The hotel security camera showed Mono leaving the front entrance and getting into his car at 740, after which the car turned left towards Highway 87. Phone records indicated that at approximately 749 that same morning, Mono sent a text saying, hey, to Brenda, who was at the police station at the time. She had texted Mono the same message at 6.53 after learning from Carl that he had been in the trailer the previous night. At approximately 8.22, cell phone tower pings showed Mono's phone to be near the intersection of Highway 87, Highway 24, and Highway 27 in an area known as Johnsonville and Barbecue. Between 8.33 and 9.48 a.m., Brenda and Mono exchanged a series of text messages which we'll have on screen for you right now regarding why he was at her trailer, which Mono denied. It ended with Brenda telling him not to text her anymore, and Mono asking her why her boyfriend was messaging the mother of his child. Brenda did not tell law enforcement she was text messaging Mono while she was at the station because she didn't want to assume anything at that point. For the same reason, she did not immediately tell police what Carl had said about seeing Mono in the trailer. Regina Bacani finished her shift at the Comfort Inn and Suites at 3 p.m. and reported back for the 7 a.m. shift change the following day. She and co-worker Jacqueline Lee then noticed an Amber Alert on the hotel's computer screen. Jacqueline thought the picture on the screen was that of the same child that she observed with a suspicious man the previous morning, and so she called the Amber Alert hotline. Forensic technician Jennifer Slish responded to the call and processed room 201 for evidence. The hotel manager advised her that the bedding had not been changed, but the trash had been taken out and a towel had been removed before staff became aware of the situation. Two comforters from the beds in room 201 were among the evidence that she collected. Fayetteville Police Department Captain Charles Kimball was responsible for the logistics of trying to find Shania. Based on the video from the hotel, police believe Mono had been with Shania and that she was still alive. After obtaining Mono's cell phone number from his mother, the police gave the number to FBI Special Agent Frank Brostrom, who began an analysis of his phone. Agent Brostrom testified that the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children had already notified the FBI about the case. According to Agent Brostrom, when the FBI receives a notification of a missing child, agents immediately contact local law enforcement to offer assistance. Brostrom contacted Sergeant Chris Corsion of the Fayetteville Police Department, who quickly invited Brostrom to come and help with the search for Shania. Agent Brostrom arrived at Sleepy Hollow on the afternoon of November 10th. Mono's cell phone data was analyzed by Special Agent Michael Sutton of the FBI Cellular Analysis Survey Team. When Special Agent Sutton received the electronic information from Mono's cell phone, he performed an initial analysis, created some rough draft maps, provided Agent Brostrom with an initial search area in the Highway 87 area along Highway 27. Following the FBI's recommendation, police began searching for Shania in the area around Highway 87 from Spring Lake towards Sanford. Having received offers of assistance from volunteers and different law enforcement agencies, investigators mobilized a huge search and rescue effort. After the hotel video showing Mono with a child came to light, Brenda Davis and Jeroy Smith told police that Carl had seen him at the trailer the night Shania disappeared. Brenda had also seen Mono try to talk to Antoinette at their aunt's house, to which Antoinette responded, quote, I don't have shit to say to you. I just want to know where my mother effing baby's at, end quote. Allegedly, Mono said all right, jumped in his car and sped away. Brenda began to think Antoinette was lying about what she knew, and Brenda and Antoinette argued and did not speak after this. In the evening hours of November 12th, Brenda talked to the detectives once again, told them about the tech... Honestly, it does sound like Antoinette knew more than she was letting on, because if the dude showed up days after her child was missing, and mind you, the other two didn't even come forward with the fact that they seen the dude at the house that same night, until after it was publicized. So, I mean, again, that, that in itself was kind of fishy because, I mean, again, you would want to provide them with every piece of information you have so that they could 
find a, a young child or a child period as soon as possible. But then when the mother of the child tells the guy who is suspected of kidnapping the child, I just want to know where my baby is, kind of says you already knew he was going to take her to begin with. You just want to know why he doesn't still have her. Text messages with Mono and ultimately gave them her phone to take photos of these texts. That same day, police found Mono and he agreed to come to the station to speak with them. Police also located his Mitsubishi Gallant, which was backed into a space of the Mount Sinai apartments away from his residence on Washington Drive. Police did a search of the vehicle's trunk and then had the car towed to the police department. The car was then processed for forensic evidence, which included taking soil samples from the wheel wells and taking the brake and gas pedal covers for substance analysis. Beginning at around 9.30 p.m. on the evening of November 12th, several law enforcement officers interviewed Mono in an effort to find Shania. Although Shania had been missing for two days, officers were still hopeful of finding her alive. The officers did not handcuff Mono or place him under arrest, and they specifically informed him that the door to the interview room was unlocked and that he was free to leave the room. He also had his cell phone on which he continued to receive messages and used during breaks in this interview. Mono admitted he was at Sleepy Hollow just after midnight on November 10th driving around in the black Mitsubishi. But at first he denied going to Brenda's trailer, denied seeing Shania or even knowing who she was. He denied having her in the vehicle and denied leaving the city limits or being in Sanford at a hotel. When police showed a photograph of himself at the hotel, Mono initially denied that it was him. When confronted with the information that the same person signed into the hotel as Mario McNeil showing his identification and listing his home address, Mono suggested that maybe he had lost his ID. Mono then admitted that he had been at the hotel with Shania. About 54 minutes into the interview, Mono began telling a story about receiving a text message which he thought came from Brenda's phone telling him to come to Sleepy Hollow to pick Shania up on the porch. He said he got Shania and took her to the hotel room where he ingested coke. According to Mono, while he was at the hotel, he got a call or text message from some unknown people asking him to bring Shania to a dry cleaning establishment at the corner of Country Club Drive and Ramsey Street. Mono said that he delivered Shania to these unnamed people and that they were driving a gray Nissan Maxima. Agent Brostrom testified that the focus of the interview changed when Mono suddenly stated he was waiting to get a call to come and kill her. The interviewing officers tried to get him to expand on the statement, but he would not. Whoa, whoa. Alright, well that one just took a turn, or just, that one just took a crazy twist. Wow. Um... But again, that doesn't make any sense. If you were waiting on a call to come kill her, why would you drop her off with other people? Like, that doesn't make sense. But, alright, <clears throat> anyway, let's keep going and figure out what's going on here. The exchanges on Mono's phone with Brenda did not pertain to picking up someone waiting on the porch, as Mono claimed during the interview. Rather, they were of the argument we highlighted earlier in the episode. There were no calls or text messages to Mono's phone from any unknown people. The only messages during this time period were between Mono and Brenda's phones. At the end of the interview, Mono was arrested for the kidnapping of Shania. When police later viewed the videotape of the interview, they saw that when they left Mono alone in the interview room during a break, that he made the sign of a cross took out a key, and got down on the floor and put the key into a wall electrical socket and appeared to receive a jolt. Mono then took off his shoes and put the key back in the electrical socket again. Meanwhile, police became suspicious of Antoinette's story after reviewing a timeline of the events leading up to Shania's disappearance, and she refused to cooperate with the investigation. Yeah, I mean, I've been feeling from the start that she has something to do with this, because, I mean... Your kid goes missing, you're not, I mean, if you're genuinely concerned about where your kid is and their safety, you're not going to 
be reluctant to call the cops to get somebody to go look for it. You're going to be like, hey, I woke up, my kid ain't here, please help me. And again, you know, when they did show up to help her, like, she was on the phone the whole time. So they couldn't really get any answers to the questions they were asking. And again, if you were trying to find your kid, that typically would be your number one priority. He accused her boyfriend, Clarence Coe, of kidnapping Shania. Police investigated Coe, but he was quickly let go after their surveillance footage from the Comfort Inn and Suites was brought to light. Eventually, the mother confessed something horrific to investigators. She told them, quote, I gave her to him to cover $200. He was only supposed to have sex, end quote. Yes, you heard- Whoa, 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 hold on, let's back that one up real quick. She initially she accused, accused her, her boyfriend, boyfriend Clarence Coe, of kidnapping, kidnapping Shania. Shania. Police, Police investigated Coe, but he was, was quickly let go after, go after the surveillance footage from the Comfort Inn and Suites was brought to light. light. Eventually, Eventually, the mother confessed something horrific to investigators. She, she told them, quote, I gave her to him to cover $200. He was, was only supposed to have sex. This is what I wanted to touch on. Like, this is as far as I, was, I, as I have seen this video. Because when I saw this, I was like, okay, I got to cover this. Again, because it already is close to home. Literally close to where I live. And, but this right here is prime example of what I've been saying time and time again in the videos that I cover on my channel. Y'all, people have got to stop just assuming that mothers are naturally naturally good caretakers because they're not this lady literally sold her five-year-old child pimped her five-year-old child out for two hundred dollars do and on top of that she threw her then boyfriend under the bus for the crime knowing what she actually did she knew who took this child she knew why he was taking this child she tried to claim that this other guy took the child to get this guy off this guy that i can't even say the word on youtube like i'm, I'm really trying to use my words carefully but i cannot say the word on youtube this guy did what he did to your daughter for two hundred dollars your five-year-old daughter for two hundred dollars and then they're worse. It kind of went beyond that. But still, just that fact in itself is troubling. And again, this is why we've got to stop with this mentalization that mothers are just naturally good providers for their, their child. Because this... I'm, I honestly, with all the channels I've covered in this, or I mean, um, I'm sorry, with all the stories I've covered in this channel, I really don't see how that is still a believable argument. Because I've proven that it ha that it's not. This is another proof. This is another prime example. This lady pimped her daughter out for $200 and threw her boyfriend under the bus for the crime. End, End quote. quote. Yes, you, you heard, heard that correctly. Mono previously lent Antoinette $200 to buy food and pay for a hotel room when she and her children were homeless. Some reports indicated that the debt was drug-related, but that is incorrect. In order to reimburse him for the debt, she pimped out her five-year-old daughter. To add insult to injury, Antoinette was pregnant again. She was, she was arrested and charged, charged with human trafficking, trafficking and, and later released on a $51,000 $51, bail. You see what I mean when I say mother? not all mothers are good mothers? She had a $200 debt. And honestly, a $200 debt is not really that big of a debt. It's certainly not big enough to pimp out your five-year-old daughter. Nothing is that bad. Is it? Leave in the comments below what you think about that. Do you think that justifies her 
pimping her daughter out for a two hundred dollar debt. A massive, a massive search, search for Shania, Shania was, was continuing, continuing along Highway 87. On the, the morning of November 13th, Fayetteville Police Department Investigator Kimmel met with, with then District Attorney Ed Grannis about several cases, including this one. The District Attorney pulled him aside and told him that Alan Rogers, a Fayetteville Defense Attorney, might have some information that could help them in this case and that he would, he would be calling him. Attorney Rogers had accompanied Mono at his first appearance in the morning following his arrest on kidnapping charges. And it was Investigator Kimball's understanding that Alan Rogers was Mono's attorney. The following day, Investigator Kimball received a telephone call from another attorney, Coy Brewer. He said the information Kimball needed was to look for green portal bodies on Highway 87. Based on the information that he received earlier that Alan Rogers would be calling, Investigator Kimball assumed after receiving the call from Coy Brewer that he and Attorney Rogers were working together on the case. Police did look for green porta potties along Highway 87 and saw numerous porta potties along the road. Investigator Kimball told DA Grannis that the information that he had received from Attorney Brewer was vague, and he suggested that he talk to Attorney Rogers. On November 15th, Investigator Kimball called Alan Rogers and told him that the information he had received from Coy Brewer was somewhat vague. Rogers said he was traveling and would talk to his client when he returned to town. He later followed up with Investigator Kimball and said police needed to look for where they killed deer on Highway 87 between Spring Lake and Sanford. According to Kimball, Attorney Rogers stated in a subsequent phone call, Let me talk to my guy and then later called back to say they need to look in an area where hunters feel dressed deer after they killed them. Kimball called Alan Rogers once more to see if there were additional details. And Attorney Rogers told him, that's all my guy remembers. Attorney Rogers would later contest in court that he never referred to Mono as my guy. Searchers did not locate Shania that day, and the search resumed the following morning. A Sanford Company trained canine officers from the Virgin Islands volunteered to assist in the search. Around 1 p.m. that day, one of the officers from the Virgin Islands and his training dog found Shania's body lying partially under a log in an area with deer carcasses near the intersection of Highway 87 and Walker Road. She was only wearing an adult-sized black sweatshirt and underwear when her body was found. On November 19th, 2009, Mono was charged with first degree homicide. Founder? Right. All right, I'll call. We got a tip. Somebody in the parking lot said that they had heard on the news or something that they, uh, the guy admitted to killing the young child and dumping her where there were deer carcasses and trash. And we remember driving through here earlier and smelling something pretty nasty so we came back to check it and sure enough there were deer carcasses and trash and then some of the officers from the Virgin Islands went through here and actually saw her in there and the dogs were showing a lot of interest so we checked it out and confirmed and yet yeah, it's terrible it's not good news at all it's terrible um, I don't even know I'm a little overwhelmed right now so it's just it's a lot I'm just you know I'm glad glad we were able to help you know I'm gonna I'm gonna end this video there um you already heard that he did it. You already heard where they found it, how she was found. I mean, this just this entire story is just completely messed up. Um, I mean, it's very tragic in itself because there was a, it was a child involved. But what's worse is that it was the mother who put her child in this situation over a two hundred dollar debt. Um, so I don't know what the outcome of the court case was. I hope both of them got life sentences because. Honestly, I mean, obviously the man deserves to be life in prison, but the mother does as well. Um, if you're going to literally pimp out your daughter for $200, you should not have any kids in your custody. And the fact that she was pregnant when this happened makes it even worse. Is because now you're going to have another child, or now you have a child because you don't have another child because you took care of the first one. But now you're going to have a child that's growing up without the mother because of what you did to that child's sister and again it's a, a it's a very tragic event that 
In my opinion, honestly, probably there were some red... Most of the time in situations like this, there are red flags. There are things that should raise concerns. But for the most part, they seem to be overlooked. And by many different people, by family members, cops, teachers, doctors, lawyers, CPS workers, uh, many different people involved in the situation um, or that could have been involved in the situation are likely to overlook the red flags that were presented. And as a result, this is what happened to this child. And this is why I say time and time again, and this is why I will continue to say this time and time again, this is why we need to start holding these people accountable. We need to stop with this mentality that all mothers are good mothers, that all mothers have maternal instincts. Because I am going to continue to put out videos that prove that is not true. And at some point, we have got to start standing together to do what is actually best for the child. Because in this case, the child being primarily, or let me rephrase this, put in the sole care custody of the father, the biological father, this would have never happened. This would have never happened if the father had legal, full custody. But it didn't happen. Why? Because she's the mother. In the state of North Carolina, that's how they present. That's how they look at it. When they look at custody cases, they don't look at how does this benefit the child. They look at it as, look at how it's negatively affecting the mother. Even though the child is doing better without the mother, they're, they're just, they're, disregarding that completely and they're only looking at how it's affecting the mother and when you when you have that tunnel vision mindset the child is always going to be the one that pays the ultimate price and we need to stop this so with everybody um with that being said i'm gonna end the video there if you made it this far i appreciate it um if you like the video hit the thumbs up um, if you're not subscribed, hit the subscribe bell or um, hit the su subscribe button, the notification bell, so you can see whenever I upload a new video. As I'm going to continue to come out with videos like this to further prove my point, and my ultimate goal is to help these kids because it's not fair to them. They don't have a voice, and the voices that they do have are being disregarded. And it's time we speak up. We got to get louder with this. If they're not going to listen to us as we're telling them what's going on, we just got to get louder with it until they do something about it. So everybody, I hope you enjoyed it. Have a great day. I will see y'all in the next one.